Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Lewis Hassel, Professor of Pathology at the University of Oklahoma. And this is part of my uh, Lab Management That Saves Lives series. Uh, we're going to talk about some basic best practices uh, with particular attention to laboratories that are developing or moving towards accreditation uh, so that uh, you have uh, uh, some of that opportunity to function at the highest level uh, with other laboratories. So our objectives as we talk today are to identify some of the roles that you as a lab leader uh, need to fill and uh, or carry out yourself, uh, as well as we'll talk about some of the concepts that go into uh, developing a quality laboratory, quality control, proficiency assessment, quality improvement, quality management, and so forth. We've talked about some of these on other videos, which I'll reference in the notes below. Uh, but we also want you to think about this as a whole uh, and how we're going to uh, accomplish these things. We also want to sort of uh, cover a few basic tools that you can use uh, in your leadership role uh, to help you uh, to uh, provide better uh, care for your patients, uh, as well as a higher quality work environment for your workers. So one of the things first to think about is what is your culture? Um, and why do we think about this? Why is this an important place to start? Well, it's because culture is really kind of the operating software in your organization. That's what governs decisions and interactions between your staff, between your customers, your clients. Uh, and so that software, that uh, framework on which people interact is gonna be critical to whether or not people like to work for you, want to come back to your laboratory, uh, regard your results with trust and so forth. Now it's true that very often the, the people who start the laboratory, the founders, so to speak, kind of guide this culture. But in reality, every person in the organization contributes uh, just by the choices that they make day to day. And so while we can recognize and reinforce certain desired behaviors and help them to make good choices, uh, the most important thing we can do is to model those things and to reward those good behaviors that encourages others to do likewise. It's my experience that great laboratories really have a very healthy culture and that culture enhances the quality, safety and productivity of their laboratory. So what, what makes for a healthy organizational culture? Well, a lot's been written about this and this is not the focus of this lecture, but I'm going to run through very quickly these uh, several eight traits or so uh, that uh, show what a healthy organization is. And you can think about how does my laboratory uh, accomplish this? What do I do to help enforce or reinforce uh, this in the laboratory? So the first is alignment of interests. Uh, and this really means that anybody in your organization or that inter interacts with your organization can see how what they're doing or what they experience how that leads to and ties into the overall mission and purpose of that organization. So your, your, your employees, whether they're sweeping the floors, running a complicated assay, designing a new test or whatever it may, may be, they can see and line up how what they're doing uh, makes sense in the sense of the mission and purpose of the organization. That's very important. Another feature is of course, transparency. And of course, if people can't see the alignment of what how what they're doing fits, then it's probably because be, be, it's probably because there's a lack of transparency. But this transparency has to include the motives, why we're doing what we're doing, uh, the data, what's really happening, are we profitable, are we not, uh, what our goals, what our agendas are, and of course, what the finances are. Uh, it's very helpful as well. And now that doesn't mean they have to know how much every widget costs and so forth, but it does mean that they need to know the overall big picture. Additionally, healthy cultures have a sense of accountability and responsibility to each other, to the other stakeholders, to their clients. Uh, and that means that they have meaningful duties, that they hold each other accountable, and that when something adverse occurs, it's really the consequences of that which teach the lesson. It's not some in, in imposed punishment or retribution. So that's very important to remember that it's the structure, the culture, the system, not so much the individual that is prone to mistakes. Uh, it's the structure, the organization that allows or sets things, sets people up to make mistakes, 
But if we're wise, we set up things so that people don't make mistakes or can't even make mistakes. Finally, or not finally, but uh, of course, along with this comes the whole matter of integrity. Uh, and what integrity is really means that what you say and what you think, what you do and what you, how you behave, uh, as well as what you feel uh, and believe about your work all mesh together to be on the same page. There's not a contradiction. There's not a sense of hypocrisy or of doing one thing and saying another, of believing one thing and having to do differently. Healthy cultures learn from their mistakes. They're very eager uh, to do so. In fact, uh, they say sometimes, you know, fail early and often so that you can be successful. Uh, you just don't sweep things under the rug, but you rather you bring things out into the open so that everyone can learn from the experience. You don't blame the person. Again, you fix the system that allowed the person to make the mistake. Of course, you have to be committed to do the right things and to do things right. Um, that's very, very important. Uh, you can go in either direction, of course. You can have a great uh, alignment of what you're doing, but if it's for the wrong reason or the wrong, it's the wrong thing to be doing, well, people are going to jump off that ship and it's not going to keep going. You also have to have a sense of collaboration, of integration, and, and a, a valuing of those uh, uh, contributions of each member. It's not to say that every activity is a team activity, that there isn't room for individual individuality or individual approaches, but there has to be a very healthy interactions between others that is mutually supportive of what you're all trying to do. Uh, and that leads to a sense of emotional safety, security, uh, that one is not going to be compromised or thrown under the bus, as they say just because of one mistake or just because of a, uh, an inappropriate uh, comment uh, here and there. Uh, you have that sense of pulling all together and uniting around that common purpose and vision that your organization has. So with that in mind, let's talk about another key habit for healthy laboratories. And that is beginning with the end in mind, recognizing where you want to go. Do you want your lab to be accredited? Do you want your lab to provide accurate results? Do you want a safe and healthy work environment for your workers? Do you want to provide good service to your institution, to your society? Do you want to be sustainable? Do you want to survive for 10 years or 20 or 30 or forever? Uh, what is your goal? Where is it you're trying to head? And if you're going to do that, you need to know where you're starting from. You need to look at the map and say, how are we going to get there from where we are? How long is it going to take? How will we know when we're getting close? So how do we do that? Well, one of the most powerful ways to do this is through internal audits. Uh, quality laboratories regularly perform some measure of self-inspection. And that's looking at everything you're doing, your procedures, your communication, your testing systems, your instrumentation, your other sorts of your personnel files and all these other sorts of things to identify where there may be problems, where there may be gaps, where you have issues that may not have been addressed. Now, in fact, uh, the CAP, which is the uh, quintessential uh, laboratory accreditation organization, has developed very detailed checklists, which are available here at this website that I've uh, featured here on the, uh, on the slide, uh, so that you can download them and run your laboratory through their checklist questions to see where you measure up and where maybe you may need to change or to see what may not completely apply. Uh, and so that's a good, helpful resource to use if you're going to start out to determine where the gaps are for your laboratory. Now, you may develop a, a long list as you're, you know, depending on what kind of a laboratory you are or whatever, uh, and that's okay. You don't have to solve it all overnight, but you do need to know where you begin. You also need to know who's going on this journey. Uh, because if you're going to move towards improvement, you want to make sure that you've got the right people on the bus. You've got the right uh, stakeholders engaged in what you're doing and where you're going with a belief in that uh, or uh, that uh, destination. So why do you need the institution or system, system leadership involved? Well, they, they should be providing strategic planning overall for the institution. They may be the ones who are approving personnel and budgetary items. Uh, so they are very critical in that realm. 
Likewise, human resource can be a very helpful uh, uh, tool and colleague, ally, uh, in uh, working towards a higher quality laboratory by developing personnel standards, uh, uh, providing employee support through handbook, job descriptions, and classifications, and so forth, uh, assistance if corrective actions need to be taken, and so forth, so that you have uh, a compliant, legally accredited, and so forth laboratory that is uh, covering all your bases in terms of human resources. That helps you to be a much better uh, leader of your, of your resource. Now, getting down into the nuts and bolts, of course, you've got to have your laboratory personnel on board. And most important there are your section supervisors. These are the ones who help dis de define the job descriptions. These are the ones who develop per performance standards for people doing their jobs. They may help in the selection of the employees. They provide orientation. They assure uh, employee retention by developing that positive feedback loop, uh, assessing competency, and obviously putting the schedule together so that you can do this to al allocate time for developing a new tests or new situations and so forth. And then there's you, the lab director, laboratory manager. You're a very key uh, person in this process. Uh, you have to approve the job descriptions and you have to approve the employee selection. You need to define those descriptions and any higher level positions for the supervisors and so forth. You may be involved with uh, selecting and interviewing higher level positions. Uh, developing the budget and uh, so forth for both personnel and equipment and reagents and so forth, and making sure that the other things that you're doing in terms of uh, policies and procedural work is going forward. You're the interface also with hospital administration, with the medical staff, with the patients and clients sometimes to ensure uh, that uh, things are, are lining up and to make sure that you're talking the talk and walking the walk walking the talk and talking to one, one of those sorts of things. And then of course, your laboratory staff, and they may or may not be part of a union, but these are the ones who get the work done and they know how things, where things are and how to solve those problems. Uh, if you have a union involved, they can be very helpful or they can be obstructive. Uh, if, if you look at them as an ally uh, and, and bring them along on your journey, because if you're successful, they'll be successful then you're better off if you're seeing how those things line up, their interests and your interests. Now, how are we going to get there? What are we going to what are we going to use to do that? Well, there are several things to be thinking about. There are key processes that are involved, strategic planning, developing a management system, so-called meetings and a quality plan and so forth, uh, developing appropriate communication and training tools. Uh, and an, a, a culture of accountability where people re return and report on what has happened. You also have various management tools that are going to help you to do that. Uh, the job descriptions, performance reviews, and so forth. But in addition, there are a number of other tools that can be quite useful, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, root cause analysis, lean, Six Sigma, failure mode effect analysis, uh, and the metrics that you're using uh, to measure your progress uh, along your roadmap to uh, where your destination is. So let's talk about some areas that may be uh, very high yield as you begin to look at things. Uh, I mentioned that you don't have to do everything all at once. Uh, and this is just my suggestions of where you might start to begin to tighten the operation to make sure that people are on board and that they're helping you move forward. So look at your testing menu look at your procedures, look at your job descriptions and how well pay, uh, your employees know their jobs, know what competencies are es essential for those jobs and how they're evaluated according to those jobs. And then as you get those things done, then you can look six months or a year down the road, start looking at other uh, tools perhaps. Now, maybe you finish that first uh, cat those first few categories fairly quickly, and then you can move on to this, uh, these other areas uh, more uh, rapidly. That's really entirely up to your individual situation and so forth. So why should you regularly review your testimony, testing menu? Well, I think you need to ask the question, and sometimes you need to ask your customers, is this meeting your needs? Uh, and if they say, well, I'd really like to have this test, or I never order this test, and so forth, and you need to look at what your volumes are for various tests and determine, is this still clinically relevant? Is this still useful to our clientele? 
Do we need to continue to stock reagents for this? Um, and all of these sorts of things uh, to help you identify with what's going on. Uh, is the QC we're using or is the proficiency testing material appropriate to help us get the, the right results? These are regularly, uh, regularly re reviewed, at least annually, uh, to ensure that you're matching up the needs, the demands, the circumstances that you have available. Then look at your policies. Now, if you're going to be accredited, you have, your policies need to be uh, reviewed annually by uh, uh, the director and supervisors. Uh, but in fact, you want a written procedure so that all your lab testing personnel can uh, refer to them and follow them. Uh, and they, of all people, need to be most familiar with them. Uh, if you're going to do that, you also need some me mechanism to control the documents uh, and to make sure that you don't have uh, the procedure from two years ago that's been updated twice uh, still in use on the bench while uh, a binder on the shelf holds the new procedure. Uh, so you've got to have this document control system to make sure that new procedures are in place everywhere where they're needed, that old procedures are retired and removed from circulation, and that what is being used on the bench to follow is matching up exactly with what's in the procedure manual. Um, you also need to review and monitor employee competency and to avoid uh, those uh, improper uh, out-of-date procedures and so forth. Uh, it also helps to standardize the forms that you're using so that everyone's using and knows where to get uh, quality control logs, knows where to find the maintenance records, knows how to manage proficiency testing uh, results and so forth. And then uh, finding out what people actually are doing uh, what their job involves is very useful. Uh, so you should ask people to, to write their job description. You know, and maybe you get a couple that are uh, written from a technologist's perspective, a couple from a supervisor's perspective, and so forth. And then you can take the best of those and make sure that they begin to match up uh, with what's seen there. Uh, those, those descriptions should include things like educational credentials, uh, responsibilities, where they re report to, and so forth and particular specific tasks, if necessary, uh, that are appropriate for there. And it shouldn't all just be other duties as assigned. It should be very fairly explicit in terms of what they do. Uh, of course, there has to be room for, for flexibility and, and so forth. This also then allows you to begin to make educational plans for your employees so that you can help them to advance, help them to fill in uh, gap areas, help them to identify uh, other things that may be useful for them to understand and know as your laboratory progresses. So speaking about employee education and, and training, uh, this is really your chance to help to uh, help your employees become more loyal. You help them to become better uh, employees, to know how to do their job better, to know how to progress and do other jobs that they haven't yet done. Um, and this sort of taking time to sharpen the size where it helps everyone to become more effective. Uh, so I emphasize here that educational events should be regular, they should re be required, they should be reported, uh, and they should be engaging. Uh, and that's true whether you're doing a, a live meeting, but everybody has to drop everything and attend, or whether you're recording it for online viewing later. Um, each of those uh, things should be a part of their accountability. Now, uh, I will admit having just completed my bloodborne pathogen required education and training that it's not very engaging. Uh, having done it five times, um, what, no, no five, five times in the last five years, I can tell you that I really don't feel like I need to read it and pay attention uh, because nothing's changed. Um, and so it's just a matter of review. So you might think about other ways to make it more engaging for people. Uh, treasure hunts, rewards, something of whatever sort, not to punish the, your employees, but to make them to find ways to make it engaging. Now, uh, along with uh, competency assessment, uh, the CAP also helps to offer uh, competency uh, programs to help your employees uh, in various roles, whether that's uh, you know running hematology, uh, reviewing blood smears, uh, running chemistry tests or, you know, quality control or other sorts of things uh, to uh, both demonstrate and maintain their competency. And this is a very useful documentation method that's available uh, to uh, individuals through the CAP. 
Um, and it includes the six elements of competency assessment, uh, which uh, you will learn more about in another session. So um, let's talk about personnel training records. Uh, you think about the skills that people are identifying. You think about what they need to learn. Uh, you think about what they do know, what tools they're using to accomplish those things. These are all dynamics or all parts of what you're training around uh, that can help to uh, improve the quality of your employees and the quality of your workforce in your laboratory. So um, just talking briefly a little bit more about uh, human resources, uh, there are a number of things that human resources does uh, uh, if you have an organized department. If you don't have an organized department of human resources that's overseeing your laboratory, well, you can think about how you do these things um, and how you ensure that you know, pay is fair and transparent how you ensure that information sharing is, is going on, how you ensure that the employee's work is rewarding, um, how the uh, change is managed and how employees engage in change and so forth. Uh, all of these sorts of things are things that uh, do need to be addressed if you're going to uh, make progress in your laboratory. All right, well, instrument selection and maintenance. This is another area where um, you need to be thinking about what are we doing uh, and how is what we have uh, matching what our needs are. And if it's not, what do we need to do to change, to bring in, to add, uh, that would do allow us to do what we're trying to do better. Uh, that doesn't mean that you always need to go out and buy the latest and greatest uh, version of an instrument. Uh, our instruments are made for a reasonable lifespan. Uh, they're also made for a specific size and volume of laboratory, or at least a, a range of laboratory uh, testing uh, volumes uh, that can be done uh, within their capabilities. And so you have to titrate that to your laboratory, to your projections for what's going to happen, to the number of personnel that you have, and to look at things in that regard. Now, likewise, as you select instruments, you need to also look at their total cost of or, or own, owning that instrument not just the purchase price or the rental price, uh, but what it's going to cost you over the life of that instrument to maintain it, to provide reagents, to provide uh, preventive maintenance and so forth for that uh, instrument. And sometimes you can get that information through various uh, proficiency testing modules that provide uh, information about performance, accuracy, and so forth. Uh, you also can get it from various users groups uh, that have uh, worked with those instruments in various uh, blogs or wiki training sites and so forth. Now, as you are involved with your instrument, one of the things that you, of course, need to be attentive to is quality control. Uh, this, again, is a very basic best practice. Um, quality control is really aimed at both uh, ensuring uh, accuracy, but also precision. Uh, of the results that are provided to your patients. Um, and tracking these over time with your quality control materials is very vital. So we have the so-called very famous Levy Jennings charts that have been used for uh, decades to help monitor what's happening to your quality control material and to potentially identify times when, you know, like this, where you've got two successively beyond two standard deviations uh, you may need to be looking at what's going on systemically and make adjustments and so forth. Uh, of course, tracking all this data is uh, great, but if no one ever looks at it and acts upon it, uh, then you've got a problem. So you need to have documented review of by supervisors of what's going on with your instrumentation and what's been happening, because you want to make sure that these kinds of Trending events are appropriately evaluated and corrective action is taken. Now, going along with this, we think about proficiency testing as well. And proficiency testing, quality control, how are those different and so forth? Well, proficiency in test testing is intended to answer the question, are my results accurate as I've reported? Um, and proficiency testing is not just a test of the instrument. It's a test of your entire testing and reporting process. Uh, and that's a very important distinction because we need to know where those pre-analytic and post-analytic uh, problems are just as much as we need to know where the analytic issues are 
uh, so that we can provide uh, this uh, kind of uh, result and assurance to our patients and clients that, hey, when we say this is what it is, that's what it is. Uh, and that stacks up well compared to any other laboratory you may want to send it to. Uh, proficiency testing is usually able to give you some sort of statistical feedback that compares your results to other laboratories that are using similar, if not identical methods. And that's a very, very powerful bit of information uh, to be able to draw upon. Now, uh, you can use proficiency testing to monitor individual performance as well as the whole laboratory. But in general, we look at it as an entire laboratory function. Um, quality control then is used to verify that today's testing is comparable to my defined standard using internally determined thresholds. But proficiency testing verifies that my overall process, my methods, my instruments, my personnel are working together to provide accurate results. And these are both essential steps to be able to uh, provide uh, quality service to your laboratory, up to your uh, clients. So why do we do PT? Well, we wanna do it because it's externally evaluated, it allows us to see how our lab is really doing relative to other laboratories. Now, in some domains, it's a regulatory requirement as well. Uh, and it's a regulatory requirement for good reason, because it makes a difference in terms of the quality of laboratories. So, for example, how does it impact patient care? Well, this is just a, a, a very nice lesson from the CAP's experience in providing proficiency testing material. So here's one of the very first glucose assays sent out in 1949. And as you can see here, uh, while the, the mean appears to be probably pretty close to their uh, intended uh, value of 60 milligrams per uh, deciliter, uh, the range of values from here down in the 40s to up over 110, and even some in the four and five hundreds is just uh, astounding. Uh, and you would wonder, you know, how in the world uh, things go? Well, if we looked at today, a, a glucose survey, uh, you can see what's happened. Uh, through the course of time, through laboratories participating in these kinds of programs, uh, these means have tightened up. The uh, coefficient of variation has uh, shrunk enormously. Uh, and uh, now if you get a, a, a glucose result and it says 54, well, you can be assured that you're not going to take it to, to the lab next door and get a 400 for sure. You're probably not even going to get a 60 uh, because things are that tightly controlled. And that's very helpful when you're dealing with decision points for treat, don't treat, et cetera, et cetera. Well, another example uh, is here with hemoglobin A1C showing the first survey results in 1993, where only 50% of laboratories were within the range anticipated. By 1999, that had increased significantly. Uh, and by 2004, essentially all the groups were within uh, striking distance of the mean. And by 2010, it's even tighter uh, with an even lower standard deviation between the different reporting laboratories. Now, this is a combination effort, not just laboratories improving their performance, but also manufacturers, reagent uh, suppliers, and so forth are engaged in this process to help you to be more successful. Um, and so this is a very important step forward uh, that uh, proficiency testing allows you uh, to accomplish, uh, not just for your laboratory, but obviously affecting the entire industry. Now, this has been going on for decades, of course, and this is you would be the beneficiary of uh, participating in this if you're not already. So how do we learn from these PT events? Well, each PT includes detailed results and discussion that allows one to compare your results with other labs that use similar or different methods. And if you have an unsuccessful, or in other words, you're outside of the acceptable range, that then allows you to dive into your results and look very carefully and closely at what caused that. Was the instrument malfunctioning? Did you transcribe things inappropriately? Did you miss a decimal point? Did you not dilute it correctly? Whatever it sort of be, that's very, very helpful to uncover problems in your process. Now you can also use, the, use these internally as uh, educational events for your employees and help them to then uh, apply the lessons learned from this. 
So CP, uh, PT can really help your laboratory to improve, uh, both in terms of lab practice and patient care. It also helps to uh, provide a very uh, solid uh, assessment to your peers that uh, what you're doing measures up to what other laboratories are doing. Um, and you also get uh, various other educational insights into instrument combinations and so forth, uh, and uh, selection of various methods that may be better or worse at uh, particular assays that are important to you. And of course, and you can satisfy regulatory requirements in certain areas. <clears throat> So PT is intended to be run on all analytes. That is intended to be run by uh, varying, uh, rotating groups of all technologists, not just your best one, but everybody participates in it. Uh, it's intended to be run concurrently with patient samples, according to the instructions. And it's intended that whatever you miss or mess up on, you check it into them before you, th and then review them, of course, with your director or his designee. Uh, so if you're going to choose a BT program, look at your test menu, what they offer, look at the various kinds of challenges. Are they the kind of things that are going to stretch you and help you to become better? Do you get your results back in a, in a reasonable time? Does this provider have a good reputation and so forth? Uh, is the peer group that they're assessing with comparable to your laboratory? Uh, and is it a big enough database that you're going to get meaningful results? Uh, a number of other sorts of things like that go into the considerations. So supply chain, changing direction here, inventory management. Uh, in fact, this is one of the areas that you do need to evaluate. Uh, you're not intended to become a warehouse manager or whatever, but in fact, that's what you're oftentimes doing as a lab director or lab manager. Because what's on your shelves turns out to be one of the most expensive assets in any organization accounting for perhaps as much as 60% of your capital. Now, if you have too much there and things outdate, you've wasted. If you have too much sitting there and you don't need that much because testing volumes have changed, well, again, you've wasted money, you've wasted resources. So the balance here in terms of getting a just-in-time reordering of the next resource you need with the practicalities that exist in a lot of areas in terms of timing of delivery, the challenges of validating new lots and so forth, the space you have for storage, uh, all of these sorts of things, uh, these are not insignificant. So you have to uh, be uh, flexible in this um, and recognize your local circumstances and situation, but realize that you don't want to have uh, money sitting idle on your shelves. Um, and you also want to make inventory easy, not just for, for one person to manage, but for anybody who's engaged in the process. So this is one little lean tool. You know, when the box gets, box gets empty, I pull out this restock uh, card and I put it on the manager's desk and it says, order more of this. And that goes into the, the orders that are going to go in that week and so on and so forth. Uh, well, this can be taken to a, a dramatic situation uh, to... Uh, look at all of your processes to try to eliminate waste. Um, this is an example from uh, uh, some of the work done at the uh, uh, Henry Ford Health System in, in Detroit, uh, which is very process oriented to look at all of the sorts of things in your processes that can be improved uh, and looking at those for opportunities uh, regularly. Uh, and this just kind of summarizes some of the things we've talked about. Um, the the uh, root cause analysis and so forth, the uh, process change process, uh, training and development systems, uh, your audits and so forth that you're gonna be engaged in. Uh, and this is all part of an ongoing cycle of continuous improvement. And that's why this roundness and this continuous continuity is very important. Uh, many laboratories for many years have used this plan, do, act, plan, do, check, act cycle, which is essentially uh, just another version of this. Um, that looks at um, what we're going to do, what we need to do to accomplish that, looking at the results of our uh, output, quality, customer satisfaction, good, good results, uh, and balancing those against with our own organization, the various other stakeholders, the customer requirements, and so forth. Uh, now, related to this is uh, something that has uh, been termed the uh, uh, lean production systems and so forth. 
uh, and aimed at eliminating waste in our laboratories because that wastes our time, wastes money, wastes uh, uh, expectations, wastes our reputation and so forth. And these are the seven particular kinds of waste that have been identified uh, that may be involved. And you can see them in your laboratory in various ways. Uh, defects or mistakes, and did, it, did the wrong assay or the wrong test, uh, waiting for results, uh, carrying things to the next instrument or carrying things from one laboratory to the next or from one hospital to the next and so forth, uh, producing too much, you know, running too many QCs or over-processing a sample, having to circ uh, circum cir centrifuge at five times or whatever, rather than just doing it once and doing it right. Uh, holding too much inventory, we mentioned that's a portion of waste, and needless motion, either of uh, people or whatever. Um, but this is really a process. To become a lean laboratory uh, requires that you begin targeting these wastes and, and removing them. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, this is going to end up giving you better performance, better outcomes uh, in terms of the value that you're getting from your effort. Uh, it's going to ensure that you're meeting your customers' needs. Uh, and so looking at standardization, looking at improving efficiency and monitoring the results, uh, these are, are things that allow you to get better without spending more money. With the same resources, you're giving out qual better quality results. So people talk about, well, you can either have it fast, you can have it at higher quality, or you can have it um, quicker. No, I said that. Fast quality, whatever sort of thing. Well, this is essentially saying that you can get all three. Now, one of the tools that we use is called 5S. Uh, and this is a very simple thing to apply in a variety of settings to help you to begin to develop a quality service. Uh, so uh, these 5S's stand for sort, set in order, shine, standardize, sustain. Um, and these sort of mantras here to give you an idea of what you're trying to do. Well, how does that look? What does that look like in practice? Well, here's some examples. Uh, every one of these containers has been sorted into the right place, standardized what goes in each container and so forth. Uh, even my pets or other sorts of things are in their place so that you can identify immediately if something's missing or something's not there. Likewise, procedure manuals or quality control records. Here they are. You can tell if one's missing. You looked at one and you want to put it back, you know where it goes. You just line up the bar. Uh, these sorts of things are very simple. Likewise, you can mistake group your lab or your hospital here. A crash cart from Japan helps you identify right away, oh, this is missing this particular medication. It needs to be restocked. So those sorts of tools can be very useful standardizing and quickly uh, helping you to recognize when something's not there or needs to be repaired. Well, let's talk about assay validation. Uh, and when we speak about validation, there really are two kinds of validation to be concerned about. And this is very important. There's the clinical validation. In other words, do patients with values outside this normal range have different outcomes? Uh, is this really a clinically important difference? Uh, is, is my assay providing an important clinical value? And usually this is literature-based, but sometimes uh, we may develop our own test or have our own range or whatever, and that be involved. And then there's analytical validation, which laboratories are usually more uh, uh, familiar with. That's the linearity of results, sensitivity, specificity, reproducibility, uh, stability over time, and so forth. Um, those are important as well. Both of these uh, fit hand in glove with each other, however. So here's an example of clinical validation looking at troponin T. Uh, and in fact, when you looked at uh, outcomes relative to, uh, uh, in terms of mortality and so forth, relative to different levels of troponin T, you see that as your level went up, your outcome got progressively worse. Um, and that helps you then to develop protocols and so forth. Uh, and you can look at these kinds of things and see what happened to these patients who met these criteria. That's a very useful way to conduct a clinical validation of an assay. Uh, analytical validation uh, usually comes in a slightly different format. 
You may look at the normal range uh, for males and females and see, well, there's some differences here. Uh, maybe I'm going to need to need a different range or different uh, proportion analysis for uh, different sexes. Uh, you can look at um, uh, recoverability. So here's a me measured high sensitive cardiac troponin T concentration uh, versus the theoretical. And in fact, the linearity was very nice. Uh, however, uh, when we looked at percent recovery uh, using standardized assays, we see that there was a variability. There's a bias here uh, as well. Uh, so this analytical validation was uh, involved here. And here we can see uh, what happened with samples at room temperature uh, over time. Uh, there's some variability, not a whole lot, but there's just a slight negative slope uh, to some of these uh, at different levels. Uh, so that may also be an important piece. Uh, you may also want to validate compared to uh, the sample type. So whole blood versus plasma, these sorts of things uh, can also be uh, subject to uh, analytical validation. Now, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about analytical evaluation in anatomic pathology, because I think this is also a key to making a quality laboratory. Uh, so what a pathologist reports makes a difference. So the big questions, of course, is this benign or malignant? Is the margin positive or negative? Is the marker positive or negative? Is this grade one, two, or three? Is this, uh, you know, this classification, that classification of lymphoma, et cetera, et cetera? These are all big questions. But the fact is that we know that staining, fixation, and sectioning are not standardized, and that interpretation is quite subjective and that pathologist training is highly variable, and that their ability to apply criteria are really quite poorly standardized. Now, in fact, my colleagues and I, several years ago, took uh, the principles like this and, and, and said, okay, what are we gonna do? We need to develop guidelines for how do we interpret and analyze and analytically validate immunohistochemical assays. Well, that's important. Uh, there were a number of consensus recommendations, which you can look at in that, but this is not the end of analytical uh, validation in pathology is looking at what happens with stains uh, and how many different positives or negatives you need to, to use to verify that your stain's gonna perform appropriately. Uh, you also need to look at your pathologists. And this is a study that uh, people from my, my institution here uh, developed to look at how pathologists applied a new classification system small, non-small non cell carcinoma of the lung. Um, and we looked at several different things and these were then summarized and published in the archives of pathology, uh, which showed that with education, we could get our performance up to an acceptable level of uh, adherence to and consistency with the classification system. But prior to that validation and that education, uh, that we were all over the map and it was really not very pretty. Uh, so uh, you need to think about that with a number of things that you're doing. Uh, and that can be basic things as well as uh, more uh, advanced new things. You may want to even look at some of your existing common uh, disorders, cervical dysplasias or other sorts of things. How consistent are you in reporting those sorts of things? So uh, my recommendation is that if you're going to introduce a new classification, grading or diagnostic system in a laboratory, you should determine the clinical utility. You should think about how you're going to adopt that and roll it out and how you're going to validate it. And that validation should be documented in your minutes and you should monitor that adoption to verify that you have actually successfully accomplished what you said you're going to do. <clears throat> you want to learn from your mistakes, from your near misses and adverse events. I've talked about fail early and often, but this is where we want to use root cause analysis. We want to avoid blaming or shaming individuals because we wanna really goof proof our system, not our people. We are all human, we will all make mistakes, but we can divine, design better systems that can be very difficult to make mistakes with. Uh, we've talked about the five why, five S's, now we're talking about the five whys. Uh, this is essentially a technique to find why something happened. Why is the service slow? Well, why are the food orders late? Why is the chef not cooking? Why is he busy washing dishes? Why did why did we run out of plates? Ah, oh, we don't have enough plates. Well, here's another example. Other tools that can help you to do this are 
failure mode effect analysis, the fishbone diagrams, and so forth. Uh, these are tools that you can Google or look up uh, or find examples of on the web. I don't want to go into the details at this point. So to summarize here, if you want to get your lab from where you are to where you want to be, you need to follow your roadmap. And you need to think about what you're going to do along that roadmap to get closer and closer to that. Employing the best practices, learning from other labs, becoming lean, developing the culture of quality requires determination, persistence, and especially passionate leadership. That's you. A healthy lab culture will exhibit transparency, will have an absence of blaming and shaming. It will have high levels of accountability. It will have high levels of cooperation. It will have high levels of engagement. Uh, and that will help you to reach your laboratory goals much more quickly and at lower cost. Uh, clinical and anatomic lab practices can all be critically evaluated for improvement opportunities. And lean, something I'm particularly passionate about, is a very useful tool to improve quality, reduce costs, and improve uh, customer satisfaction. So we've covered a lot of ground here, a lot more than we could talk about. Uh, but this is just kind of a basic uh, skim the roadmap. Uh, sort of uh, look at some of these things and we can uh, encourage you to do a deep dive in areas where you think you may be able to find value to help your laboratory. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to email me. I'm happy to answer them, happy to respond and engage with you because I want you to be successful in your journey as well. So thank you so much for joining me uh, and I hope that this has been useful and until next time, we'll see you then. <laughs>